All right, we'll see if this is, oh, it is. Great. <laughs> Welcome, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Ashley Finan, Executive Director of the Nuclear Innovation Alliance. Before we begin, I want to thank Senator Murkowski and her office for sponsoring our use of this space, and especially Ben Ranke, Melissa Enriquez, and John Starkey, who helped immensely with the coordination. I also want to thank Jennifer Gordon and the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center for co-hosting this event, and to thank the Atlantic Council staff for helping us pull things together. In particular, Tom Knoll, Lauren Thomas, and Claire Swinko, who helped prepare the room and get you checked in. In the event of an emergency, please follow the guidance of US Capitol Police officers. If an evacuation is ordered, strobe lights and fire alarms will activate. You can proceed to the nearest exit, which from here will include heading up the stairways that you came down. We have a fairly comprehensive event this afternoon without a scheduled break, so please feel free to get up and down as needed. We may offer a break midway through, depending on how we're progressing. The Nuclear Innovation Alliance and the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center are pleased to be bringing this group together to discuss energy geopolitics broadly and the role that nuclear energy plays in our foreign policy. Dr. Rachel Bronson will provide framing remarks about energy geopolitics before we move to the panel, which will dive deeper into the role of nuclear energy. We'll have opportunities for the audience to ask questions and we will have a reception following the event so that the conversation can continue. These speakers represent a range of experience and scholarship that co cover a broad landscape of global energy geopolitics and the US role in it. You have their extended bios in the handouts. Um, their positions do not align on everything we'll discuss today, and I hope that will be instructive. There are multiple perspectives to consider, and as you know, geopolitics are even more complex than domestic politics. Their positions do align in some areas, and I suggest listening for those because they present opportunities for strong policy development. Our speakers have a, at least a few characteristics in common. They are kind, they are generous with their time, and despite any challenges or frustrations they may have faced in their careers interacting with US international energy policy, they each retain an inspiring patriotism and commitment to making the world more secure, more just, and more prosperous. I suspect you will hear this in their voices, so let's get to that. I'll introduce our first speaker, Dr. Rachel Bronson. Dr. Rachel Bronson is the president and CEO of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. She oversees the publishing programs, management of the doomsday clock, and a growing set of activities around nuclear risk, climate change, and disruptive technologies. Before joining the Bulletin, Bronson served as the Vice President of Studies at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. She taught global energy as an adjunct professor at the Kellogg School of Management and served as senior fellow and director of Middle East Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. She has held positions at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Harvard University's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and Columbia University. Dr. Bronson is a recognized expert in energy geopolitics, and we are fortunate to have her here today. Please welcome Dr. Rachel Bronson. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, Ashley, for the invitation, and thank you to the Nuclear Innovation Alliance and also to the Atlantic Council. I'm delighted to be with you here today. As Ashley asked me to open uh, today with some remarks, a story from back in 2003 kept running over in my mind. It was in the lead up to the Iraq War, and I was sitting at my desk at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. A leading Japanese political expert had come concerned about the drift to war, and he wanted to know why the US was pursuing a war for oil to dominate the Iraqi oil sector. He was not alone in asking this question. Other diplomats from other countries had been parading through my office um, asking these same questions. And it was quite frustrating and a little surprising is that there were many reasons the administration was walking up to war, whether it was WMD or this, the US role in the Middle East, but dominance of the Iraqi oil sector seemed the furthest from key policy leaders' ideas and even oil sector leaders. What I did come to realize was the reason that my Japanese colleague was so fixated on the driving motivator as oil, of oil as, a, as our motivator or the energy sector more generally, 
is in part because energy and security drove such a considerable portion of Japanese foreign policy that it was hard for him to fathom that it wasn't the reason driving U.S. interests. In fact, it might not even been the most important. And that was true for most of his colleagues from Asia and certainly some for Europe. Domestic action in the U.S. at that time was confounding my Japanese colleague as well. The mindless marches in the street with placards and chants of no blood for oil was compatible with my giant Japanese colleague's worldview. Again, that energy, play, that energy was central. But again, it was, right, it was very out of touch with the way energy play, the role that energy plays. In fact, energy tends to take a backseat in US foreign policy when it's considered at all. Fast forward a decade and a half to today, and the same confusion exists about the role that energy plays in US foreign policy. Efforts to engage and explain it to the American people have careened between simple slogans such as drill baby drill or keep it all in the ground. It is similarly swung between calls for the nonsensical energy independence and the more obvious but less rousing call of energy interdependence. The public is right to be confused. But far from my Japanese colleagues' belief, energy, as I am arguing, has not played the leading role in America's foreign policy, but has taken a backseat to political demands and needs. It is not well integrated into our foreign policy toolbox, except maybe for two very blunt instruments or, I would say, or weapons. And one is sanctions, which is just simply cutting it off or limiting our energy exports, or to some extent, the one, two, three agreement, which I know we'll, play a, we'll talk a lot about. There's two exceptions um, that I actually think prove the rule about how little energy is integrated into our foreign policy in a smart way. And that is going way back to the Gulf War of 1991, or more recently to the JCPOA of more recent times. In both cases, the Saudis played a very important role in getting um, allies or partners on board with the United States. In 1991, the Saudis were crucial in using the energy, their energy level to get the Russians to join with us in the Iraq War. And in the JCPOA, the Saudis were important in negotiations with the Chinese to get them to support the JCPOA. But in both cases, it was the someone else. It was the Saudis using their energy leverage to advance US goals, which again, I think, is the exception that proves the, proves the rule. So my argument today is what I want to lay out. And I think it will at least provide uh, a way for my colleagues who are going to take to the podium to help us understand this, agree or disagree, and dive much deeper into their areas of expertise to help us think about how we should be thinking about moving forward. My argument is that American assets is a, that America's energy assets, while it's not considered a, a central part of foreign policy, has been a contributor to our global influence. And we would do well to understand it a little better. And we would do well to understand the changes in the energy landscape that have real implications for our own global role and abilities. And it is crucial that we understand important changes in the energy sector to understand and debate its implications and opportunities for foreign policy. In fact, of course, as you know in this audience, profound shifts in both demand and supply side of the global energy landscape are underway, and they are, in fact, tectonic. And they have been underappreciated by most political analysts. Today, I'll outline two important changes on the demand side and two on the supply side that are in some, case in, in some cases enhancing, but in other cases constraining US influence quite a bit, and hopefully set the stage for discussion. So moving to the, starting with the demand side. It'll come as no surprise to this audience that for years, energy watchers have been focused on the expectations of large and strong growing energy demand in developing economies. China, of course, is the main protagonist in this part of the story, but India is next in line to garner attention as it sucks down increasing amounts of energy. And while the health and the overall of the overall global economy will shape demand and normal business cycles will further frame the story, there is no doubt that tomorrow's energy market will be characterized by escalating demand. In 2007, for example, primary energy consumption averaged 2.2%, up from 1.2% the year before, and the fastest since 2013. 
This we expect to continue to rise again after a, after a moment of pause. We see this in current demand charts of China, and after several years of pause, it outpacing its 10-year average growth. In 2017, China again increased its oil consumption at, up a half million barrels per day, which, is, uh, compa which compares to an increase in the US, which was number two of only 200,000 uh, barrels per day. We should be thankful for investments that China is placing in renewables as well as nuclear power to clear its air and ensure that cities are livable, not only powered. But it is certainly part of India's desire for nuclear power, notwithstanding the many other options available to India to make it more energy efficient. The second issue, of course, and this one, and this uh, has to do with climate change and the increasing attention. This is very much a political response to, enter, to uh, industrialization and the policies we have pursued. But not, notwithstanding political agendas in Germany and the US, internationally with the Paris uh, Climate Accord, or even in China with its environmental action plan, we really haven't seen the ability to move the needle significantly. But it's something that we'll need to keep in mind as we think about the shape of the energy sector moving forward. Two key issues that define the geopolitical energy landscape on the supply side um, have to do with changes in the United States and, sh and secondly, the changes in Russia. We all know about the fracking and the horizontal drilling revolutions in the United States. And this has been revolutionary and has changed the US um, as we've known from a net energy importer to a net energy exporter. It's catapulted the US onto the international stage from an already massively major player due to its size of its markets and the diversity of its energy sources. The power, though, the true power of this revolutionary change is not just the sheer quantities that it contributes, but the speed and flexibility of frackers to get onto the market and get their resources to market. It's this speed and flexibility that what matters most. It serves in a way as a strategic reserve, I would argue, available if prices start becoming too high. The market will bring the resources online if prices drift up. This is revolutionary and it mir mirrors um, and eats at the traditional power of Saudi Arabia, who used to be able to cool and heat the prices at its whim. But now, due to, the, to the America's ability, we have a role to play in that too. And I would argue you won't see that kind of massive run up to the $100 uh, per price of a barrel of oil that we saw in the past. There is, for the first time, a cap on the higher end of, of oil and, and gas. But it's not just Saudi Arabia this affects, of course. More directly, it puts pressure on Russia. One of its few sources of meaningful and available revenue, Russia needs these resources either through higher prices or greater market share, preferably for the Russians both. And we can see the effects in 2017 of this role that the US played as, uh, as OPEC and its Russian and Russian partners reduced their output, but prices didn't follow by increasing as expected. Instead, American stores came online. Relatedly, but importantly, is a much more assertive, aggressive, and geopolitically directed energy, Russian energy strategy, putting energy onto the market and building partnerships where it can. The US has been slow to recognize this, although evidence suggests we are starting to pay attention, although we're playing catch up. <laughs> Moscow has, has long understood the power of energy dependence. It used its energy advantage in its influence over Georgia and the Ukraine, cutting Ukraine's energy repeatedly. In the mid-2000s, this focused attention on Western Europe, particularly Germany's dependence on Russia, and NATO allies' fa failure to integrate their energy policy as they had done their security policy. But for the purposes of today's conversations, it's Russia's aggressive strategy that bears attention. Russia is fast becoming the dominant global exporter of reactor technology and the hardware needed to build a nuclear energy program. This was already obvious about five years ago. In 2014, Moscow quietly became the leader of the $5 billion global energy market, building 37% of all new new reactors in the world, eclipsing the United States' meager 7% share according to a piece we published at the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. At the end of 2015, I wrote a piece also for the Bulletin that outlines Russia's growing presence in Turkey, Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, some of America's closest and longest standing allies in the Middle East. Since then, others have come to understand the quant the, and quantify what's at stake. 
In her recent piece that was pointed out to, by Ashley to me, Jessica Jewell and her colleagues quantify that Russia, and to quote them, is by far the largest technical supplier of concrete nuclear technology with three times more of the traffic than the next two suppliers, France and the US. And it supplies two times more the number of states with technology than either the US or France, and it dominates all subcategories of nuclear supplies. This situation is urgent and requires attention. Nick Gallucci and Mike Schellenberger wrote about this too in a Cree de Corps in Foreign Affairs last year when they wrote that, I quote, Moscow views nuclear reactor sales as a vehicle for expanding and enhancing influence and create defensible grounds for the Kremlin to introduce a physical troop presence in regions of strategic interest. So what does all this mean for today? All of this has implications for U.S. global energy policy, and it's, and it's for the purposes of our conversation today, let's focus on the fast-changing realities of nuclear power. The accident at Fukushima and the resulting decisions in Japan and Germany in particular, along with declining prices of natural gas, put a nail in the coffin of nuclear power among the U.S. and its Western allies, so much so that it seemed out of tune and out of step to think that there was, only, that there was any merit in discussing it or contemplating new policies. The Obama-era Clean Power Act seemed to entirely forget about nuclear and its important role in nuclear uh, power and the role it plays in the American grid, causing a desperate scramble among Exelon and others in my home state of Illinois to try to write in provisions to keep current reactors open through the extent of, to, through the extent of their natural life cycles. But of course, demand in the rest of the world, world and realities of climate change have tested our casual attitude about it. In fact, renewables have not been able to keep up with the decline of nuclear, meaning the percentage of non-fossil fuels in the US energy mix has not budged one bit and has and certainly not increased over the past 20 years despite policy efforts to make it so. And the rest of the world continues to move and operate. One of the most robust geopolitical tools in our toolbox, the 123 Agreement, is under significant pressure, as we well know, as each recently signed agreement, whether at the US nuclear or perhaps in some day a US Saudi agreement, seems more watered down than the previous one. In fact, the administration's recent announcement that is, is considering adding a new tool, an MOU like understanding, to serve as a precursor to 123 does get at some important does get some important things right. For example, I think he was right when Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Nonproliferation Chris Ford put it on the record that quote, in the last quarter century the situation has changed and the US nuclear industry forces faces significant headwinds. Russia and China use nuclear reactor sales as a geopolitical tool to deepen political relationships with partner countries, to foster energy dependence by foreign partners, and sometimes even to use predatory financing to lure foreign political leaderships into the debt trap. But make no mistake, the current difficult negotiation are of the reality are with Saudi Arabia is a result of poor and failed diplomacy. The pulling out of the JCPOA made our discussions much more difficult with the Saudis. We have not exerted any of the leg leverage that we have uh, garnered with huge defense uh, and huge defense uh, transfers of wealth and agreements, as well as diplomatic protection. That, quite frankly, it's been rather pathetic at how little we've been able to get for it. And the lack of a seeming understanding that Saudi Arabia's predisposition is not to work with Russia, but rather the US and to a large extent, the UAE. There is a better agreement to be had, and we probably didn't need to get to the place that the administration is getting, but the administration's continued fumbling has left us in a difficult position that may be saved by the Saudis fumbling in Yemen and the Khashoggi murder. But nonetheless, Ford has outlined some important challenges that we face, challenges that we are taking on head on as a result of today's conversation at this well-crafted conference that Ashley has put together and the true expertise that will be on display for the po podium shortly. So I thank you for your attention. I look forward to the discussion and I hope in laying this out, I've given my colleagues something to talk about. Thank you, Dr. Bronson. Um, our next speaker is the Honorable Joyce Connery. The Honorable Joyce Connery 
is a member of the Defense Nuclear Facilities Safety Board and previously served as the board's chair. Ms. Connery has had an extensive career in the fields of nuclear security, safety, nonproliferation, and energy policy. Ms. Connery began, began her career at the National Laboratories, first serving in Kazakhstan, working on the shutdown of the BN350 fast breeder reactor, and then returning to Washington, D.C. to work in the Office of International Safety in the National Nuclear Security Administration. She has served in several capacities at the Department of Energy, including as the Senior Policy Advisor for the Deputy Secretary. She also served two tours in the National Security Council, first in the area of nonproliferation and nuclear security, and then as Director for Nuclear Energy Policy within the Office of International Economics. Ms. Connery's experience at the National Security Council gave her a window into and a role in a top-level integration of foreign policy and nuclear energy considerations, and I'm grateful that she's been willing to come share with some, some of her insights with us today. Please welcome the Honorable Joyce Connery. Thank you, Ashley. <clears throat> My family likes to joke that it take, took an act of Congress to make me honorable, so I appreciate you uh, <laughs> recognizing that. So we have a, quite a crowd this afternoon. I think there's nothing else going on in Washington, so I'm glad you could all join us today. Um, and I want to thank Ashley for putting this panel together. It's always good to be on a panel with friends and colleagues with whom I've worked over the years. Each of us touch or have touched slightly a different piece of this elephant, but my guess is that you won't hear much violent disagreement among us. As a matter of fact, I think some of the remarks that you just heard are similar to some of the remarks that I've prepared, so I apologize if there's any redundancy. Um, but we do have a little bit different perspectives on the conversation, and I'm, I'm not uh, a think tanker. Um, I've been a practitioner my whole career, so I, I have a little bit more maybe a pragmatic viewpoint about um, how we get things done in Washington. Since we are in Washington, I noticed that there are some members of the fourth estate here. So I will start with my disclaimer that re my remarks are my own. They don't represent the views of Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, and they don't represent the views of the US government. But since I'm up first as a panelist, I do want to do a little scene setting about the issue, which some of which you have just heard from Dr. Bronson. I always like to start with the why. Why are we here? What is the issue at hand? There's been a great deal of buzz in D.C. in the, in the NAS last, I would say, seven to ten years about the notion that nuclear energy and national security are linked. Our nuclear enter energy enterprise, with the exception of R&D and some other activities, is squarely in the realm of the private sector. And you probably, are, probably already know the domestic numbers. Nuclear power makes up less than 20 percent of U.S. domestic electricity generation, but that represents about 60 percent of our low carbon electricity generation. And you also know that for the past few years, natural gas prices have remained low. Our reactors are getting a little bit longer in the tooth, much like of those of us who are up here. Um, and we've been shuttering plants in the US as utilities struggle to justify the maintaining of the operating costs. New builds have also struggled with the sagas of Summer and Vogel in the southeast of the United States. And I would note that I just saw in the news that, of course, we're extending loan guarantees for the Vogel uh, reactor, uh, which, m again, indicates that the administration takes the role of nuclear very seriously in, in national security. So what does this have to do with geopolitics? And again, this was laid out pretty clearly, I think, um, by Dr. Bronson. Reactor designers, both those with current licenses for big Gen 3 plus reactors, think AP1000, think ESBWR, and those who aspire to get licenses for SMRs and advanced reactors are looking beyond the United States to sell those reactors, those components, that fuel. It's simply does supply and demand, as we heard, except when it's not. With nuclear, it's complicated. There is a concern about the proliferation risk and the Atomic Energy Act that restricts trade in all things nuclear without a requisite gov-to-gov -gov agreement, the so-called 123 that you heard about that must be approved, or rather not disapproved, by Congress to go forward. My co colleagues will speak more on this, but maybe in the question and answer we can have a little bit more dialogue, as I was involved in Turkey, UAE, Vietnam, Korea, China, and India, um, in terms of the one, two, three agreements. Should I need to worry about that? <laughs> oh. OK. <laughs> it's time to go vote. Um, and as, as for the MOU, MOUs, this isn't a new idea. It's not necessarily a bad idea, but it's, it's an idea that we used both in the Bush administration and the Obama administration to further the cause of nuclear collaboration. 
So what's this got to do with national security, which, again, is something that we've heard a lot recently? And I think there are, are three specific issues, and I'll, I'll make it fairly quick. The first is the fact that the United States used to dominate the market in nuclear sales, which gave us great insight and influence over how that technology was used. With the U.S. displaced in reactor sales, I'll get to that in a minute, and I think Dr. Bronson mentioned that as well, we lose that insight and influence over other countries. And countries like China and Russia gain that insight and influence. I don't think I need to elaborate as to why that's a bad thing. And in the area of nonproliferation, safeguards, safety and security, where we were the biggest voice globally, there's a concern that we might lose that voice, and we have a touch of laryngitis right now. The more direct national security interests that folks talk about is the connection between our nuclear capabilities in the energy field and our capabilities to maintain our stockpile, which is part of my day job. There is an interconnectedness between those supply chains and with the human capital resources available in the field in general. A perceived lack of a nuclear future, for instance, could influence the number of individuals who go into the nuclear Navy. Those who used to be virtually guaranteed a job after they left the Navy in the civilian nuclear world may opt for another discipline if they don't see that opportunity going forward. We no longer have commercial, a commercial enrichment capability, although there are efforts to resurrect it. Our supply chains are fragile, and when vendors go out of business, that leaves us vulnerable and causes quality assurance concerns. I won't elaborate more because there are those of you in the audience who get the picture more clearly than I could articulate. Finally, there's the national security threat of climate change. Renewables are great, but studies conclude that you can't get where we need to be on renewables alone. That's already been articulated. Until we have breakthrough in energy storage or some other innovation, nuclear is our best bet to combat climate change, at least in the near term. And hopefully, with technological innovation and investment, we can get to a next generation that can help electrify the world with fewer proliferation and waste challenges. But that's a different discussion, which I think you'll hear later in the week <laughs> if you go to some of the other panels. In order to sustain our nuclear capabilities, our influence, and recognizing our challenge with domestic nuclear construction, we turn to the demand side of the equation overseas. And again, you just heard the numbers in terms of where the increased energy demand is going to be. And we all have the same data because we all go to the same databases. 450 operating reactors right now in 30 countries, including Taiwan, or plus Taiwan. 50 being constructed in 15 countries. 150 on order or planned. 300 proposed. We know that there are about 30 countries considering, planning, or starting new nuclear power programs from country with, countries with considerable experience to those with relatively little, and about 20 more that have expressed some interest. This is because countries are seeing, be seeing that they need electricity generation with fewer carbon emissions, they need electricity for desalinization purposes, and the energy demand profile countries shift as they become more urbanized. State-owned nuclear enterprises like Russia and China have, have taken the lead in offering power plants to these emerging countries. The advantages are clear. They're state-owned, they're vertically integrated, they can offer regulatory services, design, construction, financing, fueling, and in some cases, spent fuel storage in one package. Dr. Bronson mentioned Jessica Jewell of the Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in Austria and her colleagues' work in examining nuclear cooperation agreements from MOUs to, to formal agreements. And just to reiterate some of the points she made, her team identified 737 cooperation agreements in the field of nuclear power, with various levels ranging from training to something more concrete. But Russia is the largest supplier, 46%, with concrete technological support. That includes 35 countries, more than twice the second supplier, which is not us, it's France. Where the United States leaves, leads is in the, what I'll call the soft um, interactions, the support cooperation. Much of that, I think, is, is predicated on the U.S. government. So what have we done to address this? What can we do? What should we do? Can we do better? In, tw in 2012, I began a stint at the National Security Council as the Nuclear Energy Director in the Office of International Economics. This was my third-ish tour at the National Security Council. My first was under the Bush administration in the Office of Counterproliferation. My second, transitioned from the first, was in the Office of Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction. In both of those places, part of my portfolio included nuclear cooperation agreements and international nuclear trade. You can see how it might be problematic to support nuclear commerce from an office with WMD in the name. 
So why did the post get created at that point in time? It was nearly a year after Fukushima. The US reactor vendors were struggling. There was concern over both the health of the nuclear industry and the challenge of climate change. Part of my role in the NSC was to work with my interagency counterparts in the nuclear industry to see how we could compete with Russia and the Russias of the world and state-owned enterprises in the area of nuclear commerce. So what did we do? Well, first we took stock of what we had. There were programs and pockets all across the interagency that worked with countries around the world on various things nuclear. They were in different budget portfolios, they were in different agencies, and they were not consolidated under one program. The strongest, perhaps, was the Office of International Cooperation and the Office of Nuclear Energy at the Department of Energy, but they weren't the best funded. State had a number of programs and pockets of money, mostly for nuclear security training in places like Africa. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission was the mostly, most widely sought after by the international community, but its funding levels were, sad to say, anemic and it was often opaque to the rest of the interagency with whom they were talking and on what issues. So we brought them all to the table. We brought in commerce, we brought in their energy team, and we brought in their advocacy team. We got the word out to companies about how to advocate. We brought in Exim Bank. We set up trade policy missions in which the whole of interagency went with our nuclear vendors and explained what we had to offer. We went to Vienna to the IAEA during the general conference. We went to Vietnam, we went to China, we went to India. I will tell you that at those events, the bell of the ball was not me, shockingly. Um, it was XM Bank. People lined up to understand how they could get financing to buy US technology because no mistake, that was the preferred technology, but you couldn't get it without the financing. When there was a legitimate commercial tender in which one US company, because we, you know, we, don't, we don't like to choose, but when there was only one US company that was competing, we could get sole advocacy. So the example of that that I'd like to give is the Temlin um, bid in the Czech Republic in, in around 2014, 15 timeframe. When we understood that, the, that Westinghouse was going to go in for that bid, it, the only two bidders were us and Russia at that point in time, they were down selected. So I liken it to Rocky three, you know, it's <laughs> us versus Russia in, in the new international nuclear space. Um, and we had weekly phone calls with the U.S. ambassador, the interagency team. We brought Secretary Moniz to Prague. We signed MOUs on R&D. We opened a joint civil nuclear cooperation center with Prague, in Prague at a place called Rej. We had press releases. We had a whole of government approach. We worked the financing angle. Exxon Bank made many trips out there. We didn't lose, but I would say we had a hung jury because the Czechs canceled the tender in the end, not wanting to, my view, not wanting to pick between us and Russia, um, but also because they didn't think that they could afford to build a nuclear power plant at the time, and there were other geopolitical pressures, um, some of which I think my colleagues will talk about later on. So what can we do now? What would I do now if I were in that position at this point in time? One, I think the all of government approach is the only approach that we have to make. It, we can't do this in onesies and twosies, and I think for, the, for Congress's part, they should start looking at where the budgets are for these activities and, and how do we align those budgets so that we can actually make um, concrete and, and reason, reasoned efforts to, to place those resources where we need them. Two, we need to get up Exim Bank up and running. We need to finance nuclear because other countries are doing it and we're not, um, and at the end of the day, you're going to go to the place that can finance you. Three, we need to get rid of nuclear restrictions at OPIC. They're small, but they can provide assistance on the periphery, and it's a symbol of support to our companies that other countries pay attention to. We need to lift World Bank restrictions on financing nuclear, we, overtly, again, to, to indicate that we're in it to win it. Um, and we need the need to put some real money behind the NRC's international program, or put a nuclear safety program back at DOE, or work through AID or some other government mechanism. The regulator is the first contact usually with these countries that are interested in nuclear. They have a great deal of influence. Nuclear cooperation is a hundred year relationship. And if that's not geostrategic, I don't know what it is. And last, we need to confirm anyone and make sure that we actually have an assistant secretary for nuclear energy. And I see you're sitting in the audience hanging <laughs> your head right now. Um, but we need to, to get our talented um, 
nominees confirmed so that they can get into these jobs and actually get the work done of the U.S. government. So those are my remarks, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. And I'm still on you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Connery. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Robert F. Icord, Jr. Dr. Robert F. Icord, Jr. is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, where he focuses on power sector transformation and the Council's task force on U.S. nuclear leadership. He has almost 40 years of U.S. government service in advancing U.S. international energy interests, including nuclear safety issues in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. He retired in 2016 from the U.S. Department of State, where he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Transformation in the Energy Resources Bureau. Dr. Eichord's career is difficult to sum up in a few sentences, so I encourage you to look over his bio. He has served at IRDA, DOE, USAID, and the Department of State. He has spent decades working to shape and implement our international energy policy, and thus has immense practical knowledge of the challenges and benefits of that implementation. This experience is invaluable to the formulation of good policy, and we are fortunate to have him here to share some of his insights and stories from his career in this field. Please welcome Dr. Robert F. Icord, Jr. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Ashley, for the nice introduction and for your hard work in putting together this great panel. And I, my colleague Jennifer Gordon from the Atlantic Council is here, and she and I are work, trying to work on this task force and get it out so that we can amplify a lot of the positions that people are talking about in terms of what needs to be done to, uh, in, uh, in our, to keep our leadership in the international nuclear area. Um, so I'm going to, as Ashley said, I'm going to try to share some personal observations about my 40 years working on international energy issues. Of course, history is in the eye of the beholder, so I may, in a sense, I will try to capture that. And of course, these are my views, not those of the Atlantic Council. I actually st started with IRDA in 76, before the Department of Energy was created, and, uh, and, and, then, and of course, IRDA uh, in, incorporated the Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, so the nuclear side went with, with uh, and then um, DOE. And, and Schlesinger, you know, was the first secretary, Jim Schlesinger. And, and, you know, he had been secretary of DOD and head of CIA. So in a sense, it was a real privilege to work with him because he had the strategic view of energy and our global policy. Now, I think there have been secretaries that have also had very great competence, but obviously he, he was exceptional with regards to understanding that. And it was coming at a time, obviously, just after, you know, after the our, our Arab oil embargo and the global oil crisis issues. So I've west, witnessed a lot of geopolitical changes over these years, and, and I, I think energy security has been an element of our foreign policy. Uh, very focused on oil and the issues related to the vulnerability of the U.S. and our allies with regards to oil and gas supplies. So I think that's been a consistent theme. But I would, you know, I think that um, nuclear power has been seen as, in, especially in terms of Japan and Asia, as a, as a way of diversifying and reducing dependence. Uh, but in the U.S., it's been, you know, very focused, I think, on the nonproliferation and the safety issues, although my colleagues may disagree on that issue. Clearly, we've had, as Joyce was pointing out, important efforts to try to sell reactors and pursue the commercial side of the, of the business. But I, I think, you know, having joined state uh, and after, you know, Senator Luger and others had supported the development of an energy bureau to provide, uh, a sort of try to give a whole more holistic approach to energy, um, you know, I, I, think, I think that that's still a challenge in terms of, of that and elevating the role of energy and foreign policy to the level that is going to be necessary if we're going to deal with the new world that we face. And, and as Ra Rachel, you were saying, the tremendous importance and changing energy situation with regards to 90% of future projected energy is in the developing non-OECD world. I mean, that's incredible, right? We've got to deal with those markets and the politics of energy in those regions. And we're not dealing with that adequately. Now, in the, you know, and the administration is proposing major cuts to state and aid budgets. 
Um, so anyway, um, I would say under Obama with Kerry and uh, Moniz and, and, and Carter, there was this recognition that climate change was a national security issue. But the focus, both policy and in terms of financing in OPIC and TDA and aid, et cetera, was on renewables and energy efficiency, which is important, right? But in a sense, nuclear was not, at the, not in, in that equation with regards to their policy perspective. Of course, that's changed under Trump. Now, the, now with, with the oil and gas situation, the energy dominant strategy, we're, we're looking at, at trying, how can we use our LNG exports as a, as a tool of foreign policy? And every meeting practically that Trump has, it comes out, whether it's India or Poland or, or Japan or South Korea, the, can we buy, and even China, as part of the trade negotiations, can we buy your LNG? Um, you know, the world is changing, and clearly remarks of General Mattis and General Dumford and many others are sort of talking about this renewal of great power competition. Um, and it's certainly, in terms of the paradigm and the national security strategy and the national defense strategy, that's what is being focused on. And sort of, you know, we've finished the war on terror, now we can focus on the great power competition. Um, and I think the nuclear power challenge, energy challenge of Russia and China is one manifestation of that. Um, and as was said, and our, our tally at this point, and we'll, we're still refining it for the task force, was that, that Russia and China now are, are basically, they're so strongly committed and they're, and they're, and they're uh, basically responsible for two thirds of the 70, 67 reactors that are being built um, or under tender or recently completed like the four AP-1000s in, in, um, in uh, China. So how do we get there a little bit more in terms of the historical factor and, and what are the implications for our foreign policy? You know, I'm no historian, but I will r quickly run through sort of some, some of the points that I think are, deserve contention. I think Obviously, for me, 1979 was a big year, and I won't go into all the reasons why, but the Iranian Revolution, Russian invasion of Afghanistan, and the second oil shock were very significant and, and, and followed on from the 73 war and the uh, Arab oil embargo and the gas lines at the gas pumps, et cetera, that we experience. They further increased concerns about this dependency on OPEC in the Middle East and heightened uh, our concerns about that vulnerability. For Asia, with its heavy dependent on Middle East oil, it certainly spurred efforts to diversify, and, and my count was that 25 nuclear reactors were built in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan during the 80s, which is a substantial amount. Jimmy Carter, of course, said oil crisis is the moral equivalent of war, and we built a lot of reactors in the US in the 80s too. I think it was about 39 we built. France and Germany also built reactors. Now that's, you can't say it's all driven by the oil crisis and the concerns about security, but it certainly had a factor. Fast forward a decade, and as some of my colleagues in the audience know, I mean, we had the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and that had a big, that was a big uh, historical event and, and uh, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union two years later. And, and this transition was amazing, and of course we had a major effort to, uh, to work with these countries um, and to help their transition to de democratic and market economies and, and to eventually succeed it in, in their incorporation into the EU and in NATO. Um, and uh, I, worked, I worked on a very important initiative that actually President Clinton said was his one of the most important elements of his presidency, that was the, the pipeline, uh, the Baku Jehan pipeline from, that brought the Azeri oil and subsequent the gas pipelines to Europe and international markets and was the first non-Soviet Russian pipeline. Um, so one of the areas that w was personally involved in working as, um, in an interagency process like uh, Joyce was describing, uh, was related to the high-risk reactors in the former Soviet Union. 
uh, and the closure of Chernobyl and the um, development of alternatives to these high-risk reactors. And I'm not going to go into all the details as that, but I think I, I distill four lessons that came out of that from us. One was that the U.S. played a critical role in, the, in establishing a coherent uh, leadership and providing leadership to the G7 process, in particular the Nuclear Safety Working Group, which I think was established in 2002, if I remember right. We leveraged multilateral funding in the creation of the funds at the EBRD for both the Nuclear Safety Count and the Chernobyl Shelter Fund. I think we put in $500 million, um, and we leveraged several billion. Under the Seed and Freedom Support Act um, for AID, we, provide, uh, we uh, appropriated uh, that A, we provided funding to DOE and NRC. And we had extensive bilateral cooperations with countries around the region to help them with their operational and regulatory safety issues. And so I think that the bottom line was, in a sense, it proved the feasibility and importance of having a interagency process like Joyce was talking about in terms of, of, of really being able to seed, and also the importance of having funding for this, specifically appropriated funding outside of the budgets of DOE and aid. So I did interagency agreements with DOE and NRC to carry out those programs. And it was, you know, it was $10, $10 million a year, even more. Senator McConnell earmarked a lot of money, if you remember, Peter. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that was important. Um, so uh, quickly, obviously, 9-11 was a watershed in terms of our efforts. And I think for one of the aspects was, in a sense, it created a tightness in the market. And, and after that and the wars, et cetera, in the Middle East, prices really spiked. So in between 2009 and 2014, we had historically high levels, $100 barrel average oil prices. And so that led to not only the increased exploration production for oil and gas, but also the development of the renewables and alternative technologies. And as the nuclear industry knows well, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's these low gas prices and the very favorable position that the U.S. is in uh, that's not only displaced coal, but it has displaced nuclear and forced plants to close in competitive markets. Um, Russia benefited from this period of high oil prices. And, it, and Putin became emboldened to, uh, you know, annex Crimea and pursue his aggressive policies in the Middle East and elsewhere. Um, this was a part of a larger strategy, as, as you were talking about, Rachel, that was not, o not only focused on energy, but also the linkage with the military uh, dimension and military sales. I think Turkey is one of the most important, and you probably have know more about this than I do, but, but obviously Turkey was critical in terms of the development of the bypass pipeline uh, for Ukraine in, um, as well as, and complemented the Nord Stream issue with, with uh, Germany to try to, in a sense, keep, keep control in, 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 uh, of the European gas market. And, um, but then, Long-standing development of the nuclear plant and the $20 billion that the Russians have put into that uh, complex, which, uh, you know, was started and finally started in 2015, and I guess construction started last year. We'll see how that turns out because there's still sort of some financial issues because they'd wanted to get a local consortium. But, um, and then, you know, you look at the strategy, it also is very heavily on the, on the military side, and we all read about the the surface-to-air missiles that have been um, Russia's uh, trying to sell to, to Turkey and where we're, we in NATO have been objecting to it. So, and it's not only true in Turkey. I mean, Egypt, India, it's the same thing, this combination of military and, and, uh, and uh, energy uh, in, in, in involvement. And finally, I would be amiss by not talking about China just a little bit, although others have talked about it. Fantastic growth technologically, economically, militarily, um, and um, I looked at the numbers. The installed capacity of electricity system in China in 2000, 
nine was 900 gigawatts, less than the current US system. It has grown to 1,900 gigawatts last year, more than the whole US electrical system in 10 years. Phenomenal. And, you know, and President Xi is now pushing the external aspect, not, belt, not only Belt and Road, but in other aspects as, as well of its foreign policy. And, and Boston University has this database, and they say that between 2000 and now, policy, the two policy banks have spent $219 billion on energy projects. Nuclear is a small amount of that, but 14 billion, but it's still very significant, especially when we've had a moribund ex-import bank since 2015, believe it or not. How do we compete in that kind of environment? So, um, you know, tremendous commitment domestically to alternative resources, including nuclear. There's about 11 indigenous and eight foreign projects, including the four U.S. units that have been completed, the two European units and the two Russian units. <clears throat> so agreements were signed, Westinghouse and Framatone, you know, for these. And of course, now China's developing their own indigenous technology and trying to market it. Uh, we'll see how successful they are. So far, it's mainly Pakistan and uh, financing in UK and, and Romania. Uh, but um, obviously they're trying, and the three state companies are also working on advanced technologies in, in terms of uh, not only fast spectrum, but also um, SMRs and high temperature gas cool reactors, and signing, as we've said, agreements around the world. So I, I think I will end by having three points. One, we need to have a stronger public-private partnership at, on energy, which integrates nuclear. Not a separate nuclear program. We have to integrate it into a single program. So when we sit down, the government and private industry, with countries and economic commissions and uh, strategic dialogues, we have a package from our industry that is responsive to the needs of the individual country. And it may include nuclear, it may not include nuclear, depending on what the resources are in the political and economic situation of the country. But. And, and, and the in, I think the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy gives us a framework, a policy framework for doing that. And as I said, hopefully the Ex-Import Bank and the new International Development Finance Corporation can have more flexibility in financing nuclear as well as other energy sources. Um, we, two, we step up our issues to commercialize the advanced technologies. because we've got to give a leadership there. And the risk of not pursuing an aggressive program to develop these new reactors, we're going to be left behind. And these reactors are going to be attractive, smaller sizes in the developing world, where in a sense, you know, you got 70 countries with grids from 1 to 20 gigawatts. So, you know, these $5, five billion, you know, 1,000 megawatts reactors are just not appropriate for a lot of the countries. And then finally, the issue of, as I said, strengthening the budgetary financing for DOE and international programs so that, as with Atoms for Peace, we can be out front working with countries, preparing them in terms of the institutional human resources that are necessary to adopt the new technologies in the 2030 period. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adcord. Um, oh, we got out of order. Do you want to go next, Laura? Does that work for you? OK, that's how I have. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Ambassador Laura S. H. Holgate. Ambassador Laura S. H. Holgate is Vice President of Materials Risk Management at Nuclear Threat Initiative, where she is responsible for designing and executing NTI's activities to prevent nuclear terrorism. Previously, she served as U.S. Representative to the Vienna Office of the United Nations and the International Atomic Energy Agency. Holgate was previously the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Weapons of Mass Destruction, Terrorism, and Threat Reduction on the U.S. National Security Council. From 2001 to 2009, Holgate was the Vice President for Russia and New Independent States Programs at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Prior to that, she directed the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Fissile Materials Disposition and was Special Coordinator for Cooperative Threat Reduction at the Department of Defense. 
Ambassador Holgate is a global traveler and has just returned from a week in China. She has been a scholar and practitioner of US nuclear security and nonproliferation policy, but her experience in Vienna and traveling the world with NTI have given her additional perspective. She understands how the United States is viewed by others and how our policies are received internationally, not just how policymakers intend to influence the international order, but where the chips actually fall. Please welcome Ambassador Laura S. H. Holgate. Thank you, Dr. Finan, and uh, to the Nuclear Energy Alliance and the Atlantic Council uh, for pulling together this panel of diverse perspectives to address this important topic. I appreciate the chance to participate in today's discussion, and as with other speakers, my views expressed today are my own, which will surprise none of you who know me. Um, my role in this panel is to try to demystify a key tool in U.S. nuclear exports, the so-called 1-2-3 agreement. I oversaw U.S. policy on 123 agreements from 2009 to 2016, so I suppose this is a fair request. The, this, type of agreement, the, this type of agreement's proper name is an Agreement for Peaceful Nuclear Cooperation, but the shorthand derives from Section 123 of the Atomic Energy Act of 1954. Such an agreement is legally required before any nuclear technology is transferred from the United States to another country. Section 123 it mandates that any agreement must include nine specific nonproliferation commitments, which are legally binding on the U.S. and on the other signatory. First of all, that all transferred nuclear material and equipment be under safeguards in perpetuity, meaning even if the agreement goes away, the safeguards must remain. Secondly, that the IAEA uh, comprehensive safeguards are applied in non-nuclear weapon states. Obviously, nuclear weapon states do not have that requirement. Uh, third, that nothing transferred is used for any nuclear explosive device or for any other military purpose. This is important when we think about countries that may have ambitions for naval propulsion. The United States has the right to demand the return of transferred nuclear materials and equipment, as well as any special nuclear material produced through their use. So this is this concept of contamination, if you will, that stuff that comes out of things that the US provided continues to carry the constraints and, and requirements that were on the material or the equipment in the first place. Um, and so these, the, this right of return um, comes into effect if the cooperating state um, detonates a nuclear explosive device, so we have a, one constraint on testing, which we tend to forget about uh, in, in, in Section 123, or if they abdur abrogate uh, an IAEA safeguards agreement. Fourthly, uh, there can be no retransfer of material or classified data without U.S. consent, uh, prior consent. Um, so you can't send material or sell it uh, somewhere else uh, unless the U.S. approves ahead of time. Fifth, a physical security on any nuclear material that's been transferred uh, has to be maintained. And relatedly, any storage for transferred plutonium or highly enriched uranium has to be approved in advance by the United States. And these physical security provisions are actually confirmed by on-site visits by U.S. experts. Um, Eighth, there, there is a re requirement that no enrichment or reprocessing in the country that receives the material um, and, and, and none of the, any, and, and no nuclear material, uh, even if we approve that, um, that the if U.S. can't approve enrichment or reprocessing upon uh, negotiation, um, but none of that material can be transferred uh, if we approve it. And finally, any material or facility produced or constructed through use of any special nuclear technology transferred is subject to all of the above requirements. So here again, we're, the contamination theory is that anything that happens as a result of information or material or equipment that the U.S. has provided continues to carry all of these restrictions. And uh, Ashley has been kind enough to pr provide you with a handy dandy graphic that I have created uh, to help build up this argument, which is on the back of the bios if you want to uh, pick that up and, and follow along. Um, I'll say a couple words more about the graphic in a little bit. 
Um, so much is said about how burdensome these constraints are, how terrible it is, how countries don't want to sign up. But I will say in my experience and knowledge, these provisions have not been challenged by our negotiating partners. Nor am, aware, nor am I aware that any country that has considered importing US nuclear technology has decided not to do so because of these provisions. Our partners understand that these are part of our law, that they are non-negotiable, and that they are part of what needs to be in a final agreement. In principle, the Nuclear Suppliers Group, which includes the vast majority of countries who export nuclear technology, and includes our primary commercial competitors in China, Russia, France, and, and South Korea, the Nuclear Suppliers Group calls on all nuclear exports to apply nonproliferation provisions as a condition of their exports, but no other exporter has the extensive legally binding provisions required by Section 123. It should also be noted that both Section 123 and the Nuclear Suppliers Group rest on the foundation of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which prevents non-nuclear weapon states from developing nuclear weapons and provides all countries with the opportunity for peaceful use of nuclear technology. Now, much has been said about whether this provision constitutes a right, but there is a difference between a country's indigenous development of nuclear technology, which is not constrained other than that it not be for nuclear weapons purposes, on one hand, and the willingness, on the other hand, of other countries to transfer their technology, which they may choose to constrain through export control or other legal measures. So this uh, famous Article 4 uh, opportunity is um, not in indefinite, or it is not infinite. Um, so if I can pull, draw your attention back to the graphic, I've tried to represent this by putting the basic NPT requirements at the bottom of, of the graphic, the nuclear suppliers group uh, requirements or, or normative expectations, I should say, because they are not binding, the nuclear suppliers group, that, that uh, add to that sit above that on the next line. Then the third line from the bottom is the Atomic Energy Act, uh, section 123. This is shorthand. Obviously, no lawyer would use these words, but uh, I can't fit lawyers on a PowerPoint. Um, and so those three lines at the bottom collectively represent what any, any nation doing work with the United States is expected to do. Um, there are 26 nuclear cooperation agreements currently in force one of which is with Euratom, uh, so which, which covers all of Europe. So that adds up to 49 countries, uh, including countries such as Egypt and Turkey, I'm sorry, 48 countries plus Taiwan, um, which includes uh, countries such as Egypt and Turkey who have, uh, in, the, in the instance, turned to Russia or China for their nuclear imports. Um, it also includes Russia and China themselves. We have one, two, three agreements with them. Each of these agreements has been customized to reflect the unique character of each potential engagement, not by in any way changing these nine nonproliferation aspects, uh, commitments that I just mentioned in section one, two, three, but in other aspects of how the, how the agreement is constructed. They, they may vary in length, um, they may vary in how they're renewed, um, and by the level of activity that ultimately is take, takes place under the agreement. And another area of variance relates to the provision that a country may not alter the form or content of any material, this is essentially enrichment and, re and reprocessing, without US prior consent. Now some one, two, three agreements contained that prior consent in the actual agreement as a blanket provision, such as the one that we have with Japan. Um, having, showing that we can learn a lesson, uh, the US refused to grant that blanket provision to South Korea uh, when that agreement was, was being negotiated, and that turned out to be a major sticking point in the renewal negotiation. On the other hand, the United Arab Emirates 123 agreement contained prior consent for transfer, not change uh, of form or content in the country, but transfer of US origin spent fuel outside the country for reprocessing in the UK or France, and that was actually considered a non-proliferation bonus because it was consistent with the UAE's own decision not to pursue enrichment or reprocessing, which I will um, use ENR as the, as the shorthand for that. The decision to enshrine the UAE's domestic policy in a legally binding prohibition against ENR in their 123 agreement and to make it conditional on obtaining the same provisions 
for future one, two, three agreements in their neighbors in the Middle East became known as the gold standard. And this is represented on the diagram by that, that section between the two lines. And you can see that it differed only in one way from a normal one, two, three agreement. The, this, this gold standard has engendered immense debate and misunderstanding. This policy was repudiated in a letter from Deputy Secretary Dan Poneman and Under Secretary of State Ellen Tauscher in 2011, which reinforced the necessity of a case-by-case -case approach based on considerations of each potential partner's intent, capacity, and other factors. Sad to say, this gold standard is a zombie policy, uh, continues to be debated as if it still exists, uh, and I am very happy to have a conversation here today about why it doesn't, why it shouldn't, um, and its actual status. But whatever that debate, um, uh, what, what that debate has neglected is that the foundation re foundational requirements of, one, two, of section 123 already stand head and shoulders above other countries' requirements, and they will always be included in nuclear cooperation agreements by law. This doesn't mean that other commitments cannot be asked of other countries in the context of negotiations over one, two, three agreements. One of these is that countries adhere to the additional protocol, which did not exist when section 123 was written, but as a matter of US policy, this is the recognized standard for IAEA safeguards. It turns out that at the time of the negotiation or renewal of the various agreements that we have, the countries in question had already ad accepted the additional protocol, so it was never a sticking point in the negotiations. But as we consider future one, two, three agreements, <clears throat> Saudi Arabia, we may, depending on the partner, seek additional commitments, legally binding or not, that demonstrate the partner's non-proliferation or nuclear security bona fides. And that's what all of this space up here at the top of the chart represents in some very shorthand uh, uh, phrases that I'll be happy to explain in the Q&A. This is not exhaustive. This is meant, simply meant to be suggestive. That there are things you can, you can't, there's things you cannot subtract from a one, two, three agreement, but there's lots of things you can add. And these are some ideas about ways that countries could show that they actually are intending to be a, an international good guy on nonproliferation. Another misconception, and sometimes a, a source of controversy, is the role of Congress in the approval of one, two, three agreements. Unlike treaties, one, two, three agreements do not require a ratification process. Rather, they are provided to Congress along with the required classified and unclassified assessment of the nonproliferation implications of nuclear transfers to the partner country. And the, the, but the, the requirement is that Congress review the one, two, three agreement. Congress may hold hearings, reflect, uh, request briefings, and so on to develop a greater understanding of what has been agreed to and what commercial interests might be. This review process has three potential outcomes. First of all, the first option is Congress can take no action during 90 consecutive legislative days, after which the agreement can be signed and entered into force. This is the way the vast majority of our one, two, three agreements go through congressional review. The second option is that Congress can pass a resolution of approval prior to the end of the 90-day period. Now, you might ask, why would we need to do this? Sometimes this has been asked or, or offered by Congress when it's, the negotiations have taken longer than might be wished or where the legislative days might be squished um, and you need to get an agreement done before, the next, before it expires. And for non-controversial agreements, Congress is often willing or has been in the past willing to um, pass a resolution of approval, which happens then before the 90 days. The third option is that Congress can pass a resolution of disapproval. At this point, the president could veto such a resolution, but if Congress overrides the veto or signals that it could by the votes uh, in, in passing the original uh, disapproval resolution, then the agreement lacks approval and does not enter into force. Now, there have been legislative proposals that would change the Atomic Energy Act to eliminate that first option of silence resulting in uh, the agreement going into force, and that would require Congress to explicitly approve or disapprove a proposed agreement under certain circumstances. These are under debate at the moment. Uh, there's folks in the room who can talk about those in more detail, including, I will note, uh, Paul Kerr, uh, who literally wrote the book on this. I meant to show it as, uh, as a prop, but I printed it out. This, um, the um, Congressional Research uh, Service recently updated manual on 123 agreements. Um, so in many cases, 
Well, a, a one to three agreement is seldom the beginning of nuclear en engagement, as previous speakers have noted. In many cases, the negotiation of a one two three one two three agreement is preceded by various memoranda of understanding involving the Department of Energy and or the Re Nuclear Regulatory Commission that allow for cooperation short of technology transfer that could prepare the partner country to develop peaceful nuclear technology, such as support to the development of regulations or human resource development or similar things of that nature. Now recently, uh, Assistant Secretary of State Chris Ford announced a new policy of nuclear cooperation MOUs led by the State Department that would be similarly supportive of the development of peaceful nuclear ties between the US and partner countries that might ultimately lead to a one, two, three agreement. Assistant Secretary Ford emphasizes in his speech that such MOUs would not replace one, two, three agreements, but he highlights that they could reflect a US policy that would place nuclear cooperation in a more geostrategic context and provide potential importers with a more direct engagement with the benefits that US commercial nuclear firms could offer. And this is a welcome embrace of a policy that is already allowing the state-owned nuclear enterprises of our commercial competitors to outstrip US nuclear exports. That's the recognition that with nuclear cooperation come other forms of economic and strategic connections or even entanglement. These connections can be abused, such as the creation of debt traps that allows China or Russia to influence non-nuclear decisions of their partners, or it can be beneficial, such as raising the effectiveness of non-proliferation practices and strengthening nuclear security regulations, such as would come with US cooperation under one, two, three agreements. Now, as Joyce has already stated, a key part of our ability to bring countries into nuclear cooperation with the United States is having attractive products to sell. But countries also seek one, two, three agreements with the United States, even if they have no intention of buying our reactors, because they see it as a tacit endorsement by the US of that country's nuclear energy ambitions. And this indirect political leverage is valuable and has helped US promote ever stronger global nonproliferation norms. But it will not be sustained if the US loses its leadership role, or loses its voice, as I may be about to, uh, in nuclear energy. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Holgate, and I, I apologize to both you and Mr. Gray for the mix-up. That was my fault. Um, also, I meant to say this earlier, but I want to invite our uh, last two speakers. If the clock goes off and you want to just pause, please feel free to just wait for the clock to stop buzzing. <laughs> um, our next speaker is Mr. Seth Gray. Seth Gray is president and CEO of Lightbridge Corporation, a company developing advanced nuclear fuel technologies and providing advisory services to developing and existing nuclear energy programs seeking to meet the highest international standards of safety, nonproliferation, and transparency. Lightbridge's first major international engagement was to develop the strategic plan for commercial nuclear energy for the United Arab Emirates, and Seth, is, Seth and his family lived in Abu Dhabi during the procurement process for the initial four reactors. Prior to Lightbridge, he worked as a corporate attorney in New York. Seth is a member of the Civil Nuclear Trade Advisory Committee to the US Secretary of Commerce, or SYNTAC, and is a member of the Nuclear Energy Institute's Board of Directors and Suppliers Advisory Committee. Seth Gray's deep involvement in the development of the UAE's nuclear energy pro program provides important insights into the impacts, some unexpected, that US involvement can have, and I'm glad that he can share some of those with us today. Please welcome Mr. Seth Gray. Well, thank you very much. The title of the program today includes the words geopolitics and industry. The, those are not two words that normally come together. I, I'm more from the industry side on today's panel and uh, more from the perspective of one small company in particular. In 2006, uh, several of us that were in a group that we would later call a company uh, called Lightbridge had an idea for developing a new kind of fuel for nuclear reactors. And we had everything we needed to start the program except sufficient financing. 
And we thought that one way to raise the capital might be to start a business that didn't exist, that we thought should, at that time of a talk of a nuclear renaissance, of advising countries that never had reactors how to do so responsibly. And through a board connection, uh, we were able to meet with leadership in the United Arab Emirates and discuss this idea of a nuclear power program for them. And um, it was a very interesting time in late 2006 because a UAE company called Dubai Ports World had tried to acquire a British company that managed ports, including in the United States. And there were several people in this building who thought it was the craziest idea they ever heard. And in particular, Senator Chuck Schumer and others were talking about how if this deal went through, the, um, the result would be nuclear weapons and terrorists being smuggled into the port of Newark near New York City and the port of Long Beach near, near Los Angeles. And the UAE could not be trusted to own a company that managed ports in the United States. And at that time, we were talking to the leadership about, of the UAE about this idea that would entail coming to the United States Congress to sign a one, two, three agreement to build a fleet of nuclear reactors in the UAE, um, which didn't seem like the best timing for it. But one, one issue uh, happening in the UAE at the time was that they were at a fork in the road with their relations with the United States. How would they react? to what the United States Congress was doing, which just before our first meeting resulted in, in that deal being killed. And uh, the Dubai Ports Royal transaction did not happen. And one of the things we talked about was how there's nothing like a nuclear power program done responsibly to rebrand a country and its reputation. And that's a bit simplistic, but that was sort of the thrust of our message. And the long and the short of it was we did uh, participate in the feasibility studies for a nuclear power program there and ultimately in many other places in the region. Uh, we did write the strategic plan known as the Roadmap for Success for the UAE's nuclear power program and ended up guiding them through, through, through this whole process as many other advisors and companies later joined the process as well. And we decided to base the program on seven principles, which were to meet or exceed the highest international standards of nuclear safety, security, nonproliferation, transparency, sustainability, cooperation with international organizations, particularly the International Atomic Energy Agency, and cooperation with governments and companies of nuclear energy vendor states. And under each of these seven have metrics that would permanently be measured as to whether the program was meeting these goals. And to this day, baked into the DNA of the program and their operations are these metrics. Now, one of them as Ambassador Holgate mentioned, one of what became hundreds, um, what was the greatest hit of the nuclear power program. You just can't mention the program on Capitol Hill without talking about it. It's like piano man, you can't leave the building without playing it. And that's no enrichment, no reprocessing. And, and like Dr. Holgate, I, I regret how, how this came about. And I think it's a mistake when people in this building hold that out as a litmus test for other countries as if they have a program we should smile on if they have this one sentence in an agreement, but not what were thousands of other pages of other things uh, that help lead to a responsible nuclear power program. And the no enrichment, no reprocessing idea was an idea of the UAE's leadership that, that we helped them write into their national policy 
that they then were very transparent about, along with many other provisions, holding the equivalent of town hall meetings around the country, publications, meeting all over the country. I don't think you could find a citizen of the UAE who did not participate in a session and really heard about the planning for the program and the sense that their feedback mattered and would be included in the program. And no enrichment, no reprocessing was part of national pride that came from within the UAE. And then the leadership asked us to help them write it into their nuclear law, which became the binding law of the country. And they were very proud of and promoted a lot within the country. And then the State Department asked if it could be included in the 123 agreement. And within a couple of days, the UAE agreed to it because it was already their own law. Um, and one of the reasons I thought this was such a mistake was that it was such a source of national pride that this was their idea and how it was sold to the people of the country by their own leadership. And when I hear people on Capitol Hill and in the State Department and other places talk about imposing this from the United States, I cringe because that's not the power of it. It would be very difficult for leadership in the UAE ever to change what they sold to their people uh, as a very important part of their program, along with many other points. In the law, there's a term called contracts of adhesion. This is like before you would rent a car online. You'd go to Hertz, and you'd want to rent a car, and they'd say, initial here, initial here, sign here. And if you want to change the words on the form, you don't get a car. You take it or you leave it. And the one, two, three agreements were pretty much like this. They were like contracts of adhesion that had all these very strong points that Dr. Holgate went through. This is what you had to agree to, to have a one, two, three agreement with the US. And when the US made a change to that agreement, it was with a lot of thought put into it over a long period of time, because then we would apply it to everybody going forward. And this idea of one-off changes to one, two, three agreements to me, put the whole thing up to negotiation and lost the power of the package uh, of this is what you need to access US technology and US support. And, and again, one of my main problems with writing this into the 123 agreement and then couching it as the one provision a country has to do to be responsible it is that it's one of more than a thousand things a country should do to be responsible. And, um, and the one, two, three agreement contains just about all of those other things that you really want to see a country do, and an additional protocol with the IAEA. Now, one of the things we talked about at the very beginning of the program was that they didn't have enough Emiratis uh, to do uh, what they wanted to do, the way they wanted to do it. A and they would need all hands on deck. And one of the things we talked about was empowerment of women and women's rights. And this program couldn't succeed if anything was held back in that area. And, and what's interesting when we talk about these seven principles and all the sub-issues under them was the inclination of leadership in the UAE, and particularly in the UAE's nuclear power program as well, was always meet or exceed the highest international standard. And it's interesting how that was sort of national pride that they wanted to. That is not the case everywhere in that region, uh, but it is in the UAE. And they were already taking meaningful steps relating to women's rights in education and serving in government in pilots for the military uh, and pilots for the national airlines and in other roles. But we needed something stepped up. And it's, it's really worked remarkably well. And it's of tremendous credit to the UAE when you meet the people who are in training and becoming reactor operators, senior reactor operators, shift supervisors, managers in the nuclear company, managing men under them in fields that this would have been unheard of 10 years ago. Um, and seeing the UAE in many areas um, taking steps to really, to, to really be a leader in the region and in, and in many ways in, in the world in certain areas. And 
I was last in Abu Dhabi in January at another conference co-sponsored by the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. And while I was in Abu Dhabi, I was talking to an Emirati man in the lobby of the hotel who had his young daughter with him. And I asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up. And she said she wanted to design satellites. That was not an answer you heard young Emirati girls give 10 years ago. And her dad wanted her to do it. And that was something you went to her 10 years ago either. And when I met with leaders of the program in January, one of the things we talked about was an almost unanticipated aspect of the program was that it's like the UAE's Apollo program, the way it forced a whole generation to think differently and go into STEM fields, including so many women not going into this program, but in, into STEM. And um, between 2014 and 2015, there was more than a 50% increase in women working in the nuclear power program in the UAE. Um, I understand that rate has actually increased in the last few years above that. And th this power program has been part of very interesting, and I think positive trans tra transformations in society. And it's partly because the UAE decided to do this the hardest way they could. We talked early in the program about essentially three ways to operate these reactors. The first, and the easiest, the quickest, and the cheapest, is a turnkey build, own, operate program like Russia is doing in several countries. And the equivalent of this for the UAE, where they bought reactors built by a Korean consortium, APR 1400 reactors, would have been to have Korean companies that operate the reactors in Korea operate them in Korean language in the UAE with Korean language manuals, with Korean inspection procedures, with Korean style regulation of the program. And had they done that, the four reactors would already be operating and producing energy. But they chose not to. You know, a second option would have been to have the Koreans lead deploying the plants, but bring in a major international operator like EDF from France or Exelon from the United States and work out liability protections and all the contractual provisions. And this can be done. Uh, operators do operate across borders. Um, and have Exelon or another company run the plants in the UAE. And had they done that, these plants would already be operating. But they're not, and they've spent tens of billions of dollars to build these plants, the first of which is already completely finished, and the last three almost completely finished. And they're taking their time, and they're going to take about another year before they start operating these plants with Unit 1, um, because they want to operate these reactors, and that is the pull to STEM, and that's what's helping to transform society and pulling women in and raising up the UAE, diversifying their economy for what they regard will be a post-oil age to come, and not just generating electricity from these plants, but also generating meaningful changes to when the people of the country have to deliver the value and not drill it out of the ground. And that's part of the goal from the beginning of this program. And you know, I'll, I'll just end with one thought, which is um, don't try this at home. I, I see some <laughs> friends in the audience who are, um, who are also starting some innovative nuclear energy related companies. Part of our intersection with geopolitics and the title of the program is there's a lot of law and a lot of regulation you have to comply with. It amazes me how many people I find who are talking to people overseas uh, at nuclear power programs who don't comply with this US law, who I tell them they need to. And you have to comply with Part 810 of the DOE regulations to export nuclear technology and minor components, and Part 110 of the NRC regulations to export 
hardware. And you need a really, really good lawyer. Amy Rome is in this room. She's the best. Go to her. That's what we do, and we've never had a problem. And seriously, this is a very strong recommendation to some people in the room. And with that, I look forward to your, to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Our final speaker is the Honorable William C. Ostendorf. Captain William C. Ostendorf joined the Naval Academy's Political Science Department as the Class of 1960 Distinguished Visiting Professor in National Security in 2016. Captain Ostendorf has been confirmed by the United States Senate on three occasions to serve in senior administration posts in both Republican and Democratic administrations. He served as Principal Deputy Administrator at the National Nuclear Security Administration in the Bush Administration and as a Commissioner at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the Obama Administration prior to joining the Naval Academy faculty. He has also been a member of the staff of the House Armed Services Committee. Captain Ostendorf was an officer in the United States Navy from 1976 until he retired in 2002. Entering the Rickover Nuclear Navy, he served on six submarines. His military decorations include four awards of the Legion of Merit and numerous unit and campaign awards. Captain Ostendorf is our only submariner on the panel, but I know he's not the only one in the room. He has top level insight into the United States most recent international nuclear safety activities, as well as firsthand knowledge of the benefits of those activities. Captain Ostendorf, thank you for your service and thank you for joining us here today. Please welcome. Thanks, Ashley, for the invitation to speak today and to the Nuclear Innovation Alliance and the Global Center for Energy at the Atlantic Council for hosting this. I've been looking forward to it. I've got some great colleagues here on, on this table, and I appreciate the chance to hear and learn from each one of them. I'll share a few of my own thoughts this afternoon as a, a wrap-up speaker before we get into Q&A. I'll note that these comments are my own. They do not represent anybody else, uh, nor the Department of the Navy. Uh, I can't help but be a creature of my own habits. So I spent, I spent 16 years on sea duty, going to sea during the Cold War and after the Cold War. So a lot of my experiences and perspectives are shaped by what I did uh, underwater. I had the privilege to command a Los Angeles class attack submarine for three years and then a squadron of eight attack submarines after that back in the 1990s. And after, as Ashley mentioned, I had a chance to serve in the HAS staff and at NSA, then joined the NRC in 2010. In that role at the NRC, I conducted over 20 international visits around the world to interface with other nuclear facilities overseas to talk to nuclear safety and security regulators. And it's that experience at the NRC that will be the primary basis for some opinions that I'll express here in a few minutes. My 40 plus years as a Navy nuke and then a nuke in other capacities have left me with a deep rooted appreciation for not just nuclear safety, but in particular for the human element. And I think Seth touched on this a bit with his UAE experience in a very thoughtful way. To operate reactors safely and securely, you have to have good people, well-trained, committed to the task. A country does not develop this talent overnight, and we should never take that human capital element for granted. It is that very talent which enables the United States to be a positive influence on global security and safety. And we have a history of over 75 years of doing just that. But today I'll tell you my personal opinion is I'm very concerned with what impact the current decline in the U.S. nuclear industry could mean for our global influence going forward. Simply put, to influence nuclear safety here and abroad, the United States must actively participate. Yet our rate of participation, as other panelists have already noted, has decreased significantly. I saw this firsthand as a commission, commissioner of the NRC in the aftermath of the 2011 reactor accident at Fukushima. As the country with the largest number of commercial nuclear reactors at the time, the U.S. was a key leader in post-Fukushima safety discussions worldwide. And I had a number of opportunities to work with the Japanese Nuclear Regulatory Agency as well as with regulators in other countries to discuss what lessons learned we take away from this tragic accident. Many foreign regulators would ask me how the U.S. NRC is approaching such issues as station blackout, that's the loss of all AC power, emergency diesel generator readiness, seismic analyses, flooding hazards, to name just a few. 
From personal experience, I do not think we would have had the same voice in those post-Fukushima discussions if we did not have a large commercial nuclear reactor program. Many countries look to the U.S. for regulatory lessons learned, whether safety or security, because of the reputation and size of our program. Aside from Fukushima, let me list just a few examples of U.S. nuclear regulatory work and discussions overseas that I was involved in during my six-plus years in the Commission, involved in helping Armenia deal the steam generator problems at the Metzimor plant, discussions with Belgium over turbine material problems resulting from industrial sabotage, exchanges with Ukraine on what's involved in resuming construction of a nuclear plant whose construction has been, quote, on sabbatical for 15 years. TVA's experience at the Watts Bar II plant was directly relevant for us in the United States to help Ukraine. We had constructive dialogue with China on SAMN construction of AP-1000 reactors. That helped inform the NRC as well as the Southern Company with respect to the Vogel units. I personally met with regulatory leaders in two other countries, I'm not going to name them, to discuss the U.S. practice of arming security guards in nuclear power plants. Those two countries at the time did not have that practice, but they do so now. I could go on with other examples of international cooperation in the civilian nuclear energy arena, but, but I will not. You get the point. Why is this engagement important? And the answer is very simple, and everybody here in the room knows this. Engagement, whether it's bilateral or multilateral, serves as a catalyst for building and sustaining strong, enduring relationships. And relationships create opportunities to influence others, pure and simple. Once established, these relationships enable future phone calls, emails, to ask for help, or simply to chat about how things are going. This is vital in the area of nuclear safety and security, as we all have a common interest in sharing best practices. After my trips overseas as an NRC commissioner, there is not a single regulatory counterpart in another country with whom I had met that I couldn't pick up the phone or shoot an email to to have a chat. Let's talk briefly about new reactor construction. I'm shifting gears here a bit. When I was sworn in at the NRC in 2010, the NRC new reactor office staff was viewing license applications for 26 reactors. That was just nine years ago. Today, that staff's reviewing just two designs. While construction of the two AP-1000 units is underway at Vogel, no others are being built in the United States today. Yet, as, uh, as others have mentioned, over 50 plants are being built worldwide. Who fills that void? Other panelists have very capably addressed this. I'll be very brief here. Russia currently dominates the export market for nuclear fuel and reactor technology. The Russian Federation's new contract model to build, own, and operate the Akiyu facility for Turkey is a really radical example and change from past practices. I had a chance over many years, every year at the NRC's RIC, Regulatory Information Conference, to meet with he Turkey's head regulator. And I uh, know a little bit about how they've approached that. That's a very different model. We don't have that in our country, nor will we. Likewise, China is embarked on an aggressive domestic nuclear construction program and is poised to move out internationally. Witness China's contract to build Chinese-designed reactors in Pakistan with Chinese financing. This is part of the Belt and Road Initiative, the Chinese-Pakistan Economic Corridor Initiative. U.S. US companies lack the capital, lack the structure to follow the model of Russia and China. Thus, it's no surprise to see a likely future where Russia and China, both of which have state-owned models, control the nuclear export market, and control key leadership positions in international nuclear forums. If the U.S. commercial nuclear industry continues to atrophy or at best stagnate, then our voice as a country on nuclear safety, security, and nonproliferation matters becomes much softer, Joyce's laryngitis comment, and far less influential. So what can or should be done? I've witnessed many attempts, as you have in this audience, to address what could be done to try to fix the problem, so to speak. There's no one right answer. There are a number of initiatives, however, that could be and should be thoughtfully considered. Just as one example, the current electricity market structures, I don't believe personally, value nuclear energy's carbon-free emissions, baseload generation, 24-7 reliability. 
That's a very complex topic. I'm not going to get into that today. That's another talk. Instead, I will address two actions, pretty straightforward, that I think the U.S. should consider. And I'm going to limit my, my recommendations because the audience here, and we're in the, in the Capitol, to two federal government actions that I think should be taken. First, and I thank Joyce for the lead in here, to immediately address this decline in U.S. influence, I would suggest the following. This is just for starters. Increased, increase the current NRC International Reactor Assistance Budget from its current modest level of $6 million to $12 million, just as a beginning. What would this modest increase accomplish? I think it would facilitate greater NRC reach overseas to advance best nuclear safety practices. This step would obviously need be to, to be coordinated with the State Department and the Department of Energy. But this is not hard. It could be done this fiscal year. Second, a different federal action. This is a little more controversial. Again, it's just my personal opinion. It deals with new reactor construction. New large light water reactor construction in the U.S., in my view, is not credible under current electricity market structures. Moreover, it's unlikely that any U.S. companies will ever be able to compete internationally by financing reactor projects as is done by the state-owned entities in Russia and China. But there's one federal investment in the era of new construction that I personally believe holds promise. If the U.S. wants to preserve the option of nuclear energy as an energy source for the future, and I'm an all-the-above strategist here, and if we want to be a player in the international market, I suggest that the federal government directly invest, directly invest in SMRs. While new scales SMR is the most commonly talked about, there's many other technologies out there. I'm not here to push one or the other. But I think the SMR technology is one area where the United States has a competitive advantage. We have great engineers working on these projects, and there are a lot of really good ideas out there, and I've seen many of them. One could imagine significant enhancement for the prospects for SMR success if the federal government ordered a book of 10 SMRs, or to minimum, guaranteed power purchase agreements for the output of 10 SMRs once in operation. The NELA legislation introduced last year is one start down this road, and I applaud that, but it's probably not enough. Why would this government investment in SMRs matter? Here are a few responses. It would provide a known source of guaranteed financing. A guaranteed build of, let's say, 10 units would incentivize investment in manufacturing capability so as to hopefully achieve economies of scale. It would reduce the risk of the nth unit. As a data point, over the life of the Trident Ballistic Missile Submarine Construction Program, there is an approximate 75% efficiency savings in construction from the first submarine to the 18th. This effort on SMRs will be accompanied by U.S. NRC design certification which in spite of the decline of the U.S. commercial industry is still considered a world-class standard. As noted by others, many countries do not have the need for robust electrical grids. They don't need 1,000 megawatt increments. But 60 or 100, 125, 200 might make sense. What happens if we do not make these investments? While no one has a crystal ball, I think it's fair to say that the talented human capital essential to safe nuclear operation will migrate to other sectors. I've already seen it. It is naive to think we can let nuclear power disappear for a generation in the United States and then magically reappear as a future energy source for our country. That's not the way the world works. The implications for U.S. influence globally in the nuclear safety and security arena are closing, or clear. Excuse me. I'll close. I personally believe our commercial nuclear industry is at a critical juncture. None of us in this room should assume that the status quo policies will ensure the survival of that industry. If we want to preserve nuclear power as an energy source for the future and our ability to influence nuclear safety globally, it's my personal opinion that aggressive federal action is required. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Captain Ostendorf. Um, okay, so we're going to move to our question and answer session. Um, I have a couple prepared questions, but um, Brett Rampall and, uh, from Clean Air Task Force and Hirsch Desai from Nuclear 
Energy Institute have microphones. If you have a question, please raise your hand and they will bring one to you. Go ahead. Hi, um, thank you all for your comments. Um, I guess the general question is, if we want to beat the competition, whether it's Russia or China, that means doing deals. And when you look at how those deals are done at a government to government level, as opposed to like open procurements where everybody bids, and you look at a Rosatom that is sort of the Russian government and Russian industry all in one, and it's one conversation, and they bring everything to the table, how do we put together that deal on the US side? You know, not to pick on Westinghouse, but coming out of bankruptcy, they said, we only want to be a reactor vendor, which is fine. That's a corporate decision. But then who puts together the deal around that on the corporate side? Who leads akin to KEPCO in the UAE that stood in front of all of Korean industry and said, we'll wrap the deal. We'll make sure it happens. And then how in the US government What's the office that's going to put together that deal so that we don't have what happened in Sinop in Turkey, where you had the Japanese government cut a deal with the Turkish government, sign an intergovernmental agreement, and then effectively Japanese industry couldn't deliver on the promises in those agreements because it wasn't coordinated between the people in the Japanese government and the companies themselves. So how does this happen and who's going to do it? I'm going to ask Mr. Gray and Ms. Connery to both address that question, if you would, first. So thanks, Paul, for the question. The, this is a perennial problem. Um, but what I would say from, from my standpoint, we are, we are not going to uh, create an industrial policy for the United States of America. We are not going to put the nuclear industry back into the US government. I just don't see that happening. And I don't think that's a realistic viewpoint. Um, what we tried to do and what we st I still have ho hope we could hold out to do is just like we created a Team USA on the government side and, and uh, marshaled our resources to come up with a package, we wanted the industry to do the same thing, but the industry was too disparate, um, too challenged with the ability to come up with that. I think you're seeing now with at least how some of the companies have aligned themselves with regards to Saudi, that companies are getting the idea that they are going to have to not just be a design um, con company, that they're going to have to get the construction company, they're going to have to get these other parts of the deal together. And it's, it's got to be a tailored approach because every country is going to need something different or at, le at different levels or at different times. But what's going to have to happen is that those companies are going to have to think in the longer term and they're going to have to start earlier and not wait for that bid to come out if the bid does come out. How does that coordinate with the government? Well, there's a couple of different models. What, what we did was we used uh, the Commerce Department and the Advocacy Center to understand who was interested in, doing, in participating in those bids, and we coordinated with them in specific. And I think that you could still um, have companies go through the, to the Commerce Department, get the advocacy from the US government, the big US government, and then have the interagency work to, to kind of um, mirror what's, be, what's happening on the industry side, recognizing again what the needs of that particular com company are, or that particular country are. And, you know, and Seth will, will, will follow up, but companies like Seth's, that's what they do, right? That the whole idea is that they put the strategy together to help countries and to help companies um, take advantage of those opportunities overseas. So there are ways to do it. it I don't think it has to be a, uh, the, you know, a nanny state on behalf of the US government coming in and, and telling, dictating to the industry how they should do their business. But I think industry has to understand that it's not going to be, you know, we're just a design company and we're not gonna, we, it's up to the country that's bidding to determine who else gets to play in that, in that bid. Yeah, Paul. Um this is an industry that's benefited by you know people who are up here on the panel who, when in government, have really done a lot to to help industry and understand what's going on. And part part of my perception is that some other countries get a little too much credit. Um, that South Korea and France developed large internal <laughs> nuclear power programs for their own internal energy and strategic reasons. And it had nothing to do with anything outside their borders. And uh, then Russia you know, and China start, started doing the same. A and then with this capacity 
they, they could use that capacity overseas, a- outside their countries in ways um, that, that made sense uh, from a business perspective before they, in effect, weaponized some of their export credit and, and bids um, for strategic reasons. And the U.S. has the largest nuclear power program in the world with 98 large reactors operating today at the highest level of efficiency of any fleet of reactors in the world with the best nuclear regulator, with the best technology, with the most innovation, and a lot of of strengths here. But these are spread out among a lot of utilities operating a lot of different reactors, not one nationalized program, and not one utility that has the size or the desire to try to sort of dominate in Pakistan or or somewhere else in the world like some other countries do. And as as the nuclear markets changed and countries that never had reactors decided to try to get them um, and decided it was easier to go with more of a turnkey approach that could be like the UAE where a country comes in and has the nuclear technology and designs the plant and builds the plant um, and participates toward getting to operate it or a real turnkey approach like the Russian build, own, operate where they do the whole thing and the home country getting the reactor has to do almost nothing. Um, The US companies were never structured that way because it was the utilities that would order the reactor so they wouldn't need someone else to operate it for them. That's what they would do. And they had the capacity to manage a company like Bechtel or Floor that would build it and a company like GE or Westinghouse that had the technology for the nuclear reactor. And each individual utility in a bespoke way could put those deals together themselves. And our industry was just not structured to go do these turnkey deals overseas that these other countries were structured to do initially just for home domestic reasons. So now, what do we do given that reality of the world? And I think the other panelists have hit on the key points. We need a functioning export-import bank so we can bring the needed financing that other countries are looking for. Um, I, I think that you know the small modular reactors, as represented by you know, Chris Colbert and New Scale here, is really, I think, the leading small reactor designer and soon-to-be vendor in the world you know, is really bringing U.S technology and in very serious discussions in many countries to bring reactors that don't require um, you know, tens of billions of dollars of financing to deploy overseas, and much of which can be built modularly in factories and, and shipped, including um, the whole nuclear reactor portion of the plant. And um, you know, to use the UAE as an example, the US vendors did not win the contract to deploy or build the reactors, but our companies did get billions of dollars in contracts to supply that project and still do and will more in the future. And there are more tenders that will be coming out to support the program. And that's happening in other countries too. And as we heard referencing an article that Dr. Finan had circulated to some of the panelists beforehand, the U.S. really leads in the so-called soft aspect of nuclear on safety, on security, on non-proliferation. And there's actually a lot of money in that, in helping other countries with their programs. And Russia's leading more with the hard aspects of, uh, of the reactor, the construction, the decommissioning, spent fuel um, issues. Um, so, so I'd like to see the U.S. step up more. I think Exim Bank is a key to it. Um, but I also think uh, we have a lot to offer right now. And with small modular reactors, you know, we'll have even more. Thank you. Bob, go ahead. Um, in thinking about my experience in, in uh, both aid and state in terms of trying to pursue uh, commercial issues um, and opportunities for U.S. companies. Um, I, I think that the, the 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 development of these long-term relationships and personal human resource relationships are very important. 
Um, and, and we can do better at developing the uh, sort of public-private partnerships uh, that can, in a sense, give this uh, interaction opportunities to grow. And uh, the one the case that I remember, um, and this was not the, what Joyce was talking about in terms of later Timlin, but it was early Timlin. After the Czech Republic became independent, they were they were tr wanted to finish the Timlin plant that was had been partially constructed. Well, we we had established as part of our um, efforts a utility partnership program in the Eastern Europe, and that linked U.S. utilities with these uh, utilities in these countries on a whole range of both technical and uh, operational issues, everything from consumer service to, you know, to, to uh, you know, uh, repairs and maintenance. Um, and, um, and so it happened that with the Czech Republic, we went with Houston Power and Light, and the senior vice president was of Czech origin. And, and so, but we had this ongoing partnership. They were, you know, Houston Power and Light had operated the Midland or whatever you call it, a nuclear power plant. And so we had this opportunity to build a personal relationship with the Czech language, mm -hmm. with the company, with the country, and to work with Westinghouse, who was in competition for the, uh, this, uh, for the INC and parts of the uh, Timlin reactor. And, uh, and, they won, and they won the deal. Oh, and uh, of course, this was interesting because it grafted a Western INC onto the Russia onto the Russian reactor systems. But, but um, so that's one example. And then I think also uh, this question of, of 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 the priority and the high level of tension and cooperation between the agencies with industry becomes very important. And we did a pursuit a pursuit of program in in, uh, in Algeria. Or senior State Department undersecretary, the head of D, uh, secretary of DOE, secretary of commerce, all worked together to, in a sense, and uh, you know, and we made lots of visits out there talking with the, with them about the, particularly the tender to make sure that the tender process that was going through was not going to disadvantage U.S. companies. Um, and uh, but I, so I think that kind of close collaboration within at high levels of the U.S. government with industry and sitting down and making sure that these processes are transparent and, and that we have a fair chance of, of competing uh, is very important given the personal involvement. You know, I mean, I've watched Putin for many years. Uh, met him in St. Petersburg before he moved up. And he, you know, he's personally involved in almost every major decision. Some people, you know, sort of, argue about that. But uh, so I think, you know, you've got to have that high level of focused attention if in some, in some of these areas, especially when you're competing with, uh, with Russia and China. Thank you, Bob. I want to go to the next, so the person who has the microphone, yeah. Amy. <laughs> Great. Uh, I just want to say thank you at the outset to all our speakers and to NIA and Atlantic Council for organizing this event. It's been very, very interesting to hear you all speak. Um, my question is for Ambassador Holgate. I was looking at an infographic today that showed that 10 countries in Africa are looking at developing or expanding nuclear power programs. It broke down all the agreements for nuclear cooperation that each of those countries had with other countries. Eight out of the 10 had nuclear cooperation agreements in place with Russia. Five out of the 10 had them with China. Zero had them in place for the United States. Do you think that the MOU serving as a precursor to a 123 agreement could help get the U.S. foot in the door to help these programs as they're looking at shaping and developing and expanding? Um, thanks, Amy. Um, I do think it can be helpful. Um, the Many of those MOUs, or so whatever they're called, the nuclear cooperation understandings that are reached, are aspirational and primarily political. I, I don't think anybody thinks that those eight in, that Russia is going to build reactors in all eight countries, or that China is going to react, build reactors in all, all five countries. But it it begins a way of binding them together. I think for the United States, the one two three agreement is a heavy diplomatic negotiating and congressional lift, and so we tend not to do it if there's not a sale nearby, uh, or at least in principle. Um, and I think to be able to create a lower 
um, lower level of burden for a you know an ability to have a conversation and to begin to create the kind of personal relationships that um, Bill talked about and others on this panel um, is an, an, a, a beneficial add. Now we have had these. The, these MOUs exist already. Um, they, the you know, Department of Energy does them, NRC, NRC does them. But if a State Department, you know, kind of imprimatur that it's okay to have nuclear conversations short of transfer of technology, um, that that helps signal that possibility both to the countries and to U.S. companies that that want to be part of that conversation. I think that's all to the good. Um, and helps then create a, a stronger likelihood that U.S. will be favorably considered when they, if and when they do decide to actually go through uh, a construction process. Go ahead, Joyce. So, so, Amy, I would also look at like what they meant by MOUs because I know that we've had cooperation with a number of those countries that they talked about um, having cooperation agreements with. With Africa, so it could be the the comment that the Laura made, which is that they are, quote unquote, lesser agreements or at lesser MOUs. I will I will note that um, we don't do a great job in the in the bureaucracy of the United States, and 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 I remember this happening at the Department of Energy of keeping track of those agreements and where they came from, because it could be that the Office of International um, uh, cooperation within the Department of Energy had that agreement, or it could be that it was in the Office of Nuclear Energy, or it could be that it was in a different office, or it could be that it was at State Department. But the State Department's had a program doing nuclear security cooperation in those countries for a number of years and has started to develop those relationships. And in the margins of the 2010, I think, Nuclear Security Summit, we actually met with a number of heads of state of African countries who were looking to go down the road of nuclear. So um, maybe we haven't done a good job of bookkeeping, and maybe it's um, you know a good idea for the State Department to kind of coalesce those agreements. But this, it, it, to me, it goes down to the issue of coordination and who's actually leading the charge. Is, it, is at State Department ISN going to take the lead now? Is it going to be the Office of Energy and Natural Resources at the State Department? Is it going to be Commerce? Is it going to be the White House? I just don't know who's leading the charge right now. Thank you. I saw a bunch of hands go up, so if you'll get mics. Thank you. Thanks for the panel. My name is Li Yang. Uh, I'm very interested to know this panel have a very interesting issues about securities. And uh, I think you want the government to help. However, one of my major concerns is that this panel mentioned PPP. This public-private partnership. This uh, term has been propaganda everywhere from local to federal, of course to global, now to security. They concern me a lot because that really reflect extreme fraud and crime with a lot of government official misconduct, government gang, if you call it, and a lot of abuse. So but that caused a lot of social issues, including elections. So you will know how government cannot reform because of PPP. And this is not just now, this is way back to decades. And it was always like this, but they never resolve anything. If you have complaint, they have improper processing or complaint procedure proceedings. So all the record is not maintained correctly. All the data is not proper, is not reliable. So I just thought if we can con reform the government instead of ask government to do a PPP, there will be a big step. And since you are mentioning PPP, so you know how to go back, trace back to correct the problem. So this is very important issues. If you don't think you can correct this problem, you don't ask government to issue bound and bound and bound. Because what they are doing is financial institution, and they ask um, government to issue bound. So then they say, I don't have a, uh, give you a good credit rating unless you borrow more money. So you see how, how stupid the government is because they planned the government official there so they can cooperate with the, those foreign crime. So I hope you really make this as a very major issues. We got to change the government first. If you want to have a PPP, that means in a business sense, you must state how much percentage is for government input, 
then how much percentage is for output for all the taxpayers? Okay, I think other than that, that's the whole thing is a wrap. But let me let me just ask the panel to re I'll, I'll ask the panel um, to respond to a Thank flavor you. of that question, which is, um, do you have concerns about transparency? in public-private partnerships um, to the extent that those have been proposed? Are you concerned about transparency in our government or are there things we should be thinking about to make sure that those are um, you know, appropriately done? Well, I think when I mentioned that word, I was referring more to the issue of cooperation between the U.S. government and the U.S. private sector, not in terms of the structuring of the deal overseas. Because in a sense, I think that, that unless the U.S. government and, and industry can work together and the U.S. government has some resources to put into the relationship, it's going to be more difficult for the company to, to, uh, to, to pursue the, uh, successfully the uh, opportunity. So that, that was the context I used it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, next question. Jackie, please. Really interesting. Um, and I just wanted to kind of touch on the financing piece that has kind of been threaded through a lot of the different comments that were made. Um, Joyce, you talked about Exum, obviously, and we've talked about the new U.S. IDFC. Um, one thing that I'm really curious about is um, steps we can take in the whole sort of nuclear community to try to ensure that the um, restrictions on funding for nuclear infrastructure that exist in OPIC don't come over to the, to the U.S. IDFC. Um, and just interested in hearing all of your thoughts on that process and um, basically how folks in the NGO community and in other spaces can potentially help take steps to ensure that the US IDFC is in a place to be able to, to work in this area. Thanks. Thanks, Jackie. And I wanna not actually get everyone's thoughts on it um, in the interest of time, but who, who would like to respond? You just put a finger up. Nobody wants to take it? Well, um, Bob, do you have any thoughts on it? Well, I, I think uh, clearly there is a lot of thought going into how to structure the, <laughs> the, the programs. I mean, at this point, my view is it's important, as I said, that energy continue to play a prominent position in the role of the new organization. And I think there's a great deal of, of, of support for that position on the Hill and elsewhere. Um, you know, having seen OPIC over the years, um, Energy has been an important element of the, of the lending program. But the issue is that the money that, that has been able to be put forward for, these, for the energy programs are minuscule compared to what, other, what is needed in, in terms of maintaining the U.S. position. I did a, recently did a paper on U.S. international cooperation and assistance. Um, in in f 16 my estimate is that, in a sense, overall U.S. international energy assistance was about $2.5 Maybe 20 million is nuclear. Does that tell you something? You know, OPEC, OPEC had grew their energy portfolio to over a billion dollars a year in power Africa and other regions of the world. But, uh, you know, nuclear is not on the table. And if we're serious about it, we got we to step up and ensure that the kinds of resources, both from the trade and investment agencies and from the assistance agencies, are there to ensure that nuclear is, is con considered as part of an overall energy strategy by the U.S. government and all of above availability to countries. And so I think that is really how I would respond to the IFC's issue of agenda and resource priorities. Thank you, Bob. And further questions? I was Popper from the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. I guess I'd like to challenge a basic assumption of the panel, which is that there's a growing nuclear industry around the world. Uh, every indication is quite the contrary. At best, it's flat. Most likely, it's declining. Uh, look at the price of uranium. That's a pretty good marker of what people expect from the nuclear industry in the future. Uh, look at any independent or credible study. They don't expect growth in the nuclear share of power worldwide. Uh, the, statistics cited, the statistics cited were uh, two-thirds of plants were being built by Russia and China. Well, there's a good reason. Most of those plants are in China. China's building its own plants. Uh, let's see. So I'm Plants all, being um, built in Jordan, Pakistan, and Turkey. Well, there's none being built in Jordan. Nobody else wants to build plants in Pakistan. 
and Russia is desperately looking for financing for the plant in Russia in Turkey. I think we we understand the gist of your um, statement. Are there any reactions to the assertion that um, the the industry is not growing overseas within the panel? I'll just start with I think what we said was the demand for energy is growing. The the outlook is that they want. Countries are looking at um, energy mixes that are lower carbon emitting. There aren't a lot of solution sets out there for those countries when it comes to baseload energy that will help them as they, a lot of them are moving toward more industrialization. India was also cited as looking to build more plants, and they are looking to build plants either from the United States or from, from Russia. So I think um, the, nobody has a crystal ball. Uh, nobody could have predicted Fukushima. I don't think uranium prices are a good um, measurement anymore as we are looking around the room and there are uh, companies that are looking at advanced reactor technology that wouldn't use as much uranium per se in their reactor designs. So I, I think in order to stay in the game in the long term, in order to understand what the markets are going to be going forward, and in order to, to move an innovation agenda that has advanced nuclear reactors, we have to continue to invest in it. And, and if you recalled my remarks on the, on the, on the security front, I, I pointed to three things. One, the influence in the nuclear energy in the world, whether or not it's existing energy or future energy, and what the United States role in it. The second would be the, uh, the security aspect of climate change. And the third would be uh, the assertion that um, in order for us to maintain our nuclear deterrent, and I know you have issues with our nuclear deterrent, <laughs> uh, we, we have to be able to keep technologies alive in, this United, in the United States to include a supply chain and human capital resource chain. Well, it, it's clear that if you look at uh, a lot of the forecast, I mean, nuclear is is dis almost dismissed in terms of the future uh, applicability in a lot of the regions. And, uh, and that those forecasts tend to be based on economic analysis alone. And, and clearly, given the declining cost of, of renewables, uh, you know, you're seeing that in, in gas and the low gas prices, you're seeing inc increasing investment in that, and you're seeing that, uh, you know, that renewables accounts for over 50% of new power investment. But there's still a large potential for, in a sense, uh, baseload power, both large and small, uh, that nuclear could, uh, could provide. And I think the other thing that is clear is that countries make decisions <laughs> not just on economic basis. Uh, you know, they make decisions on, on, on political and foreign policy and security reasons as well. Um, and, uh, and when you have Russia and China and others coming in with offers that of, of uh, you know, of financing, $10, $20 billion financing, it makes it hard, especially with uh, it's countries with weak governance and et cetera, to resist that. Um, but I think, I really think that we need to sort of look to the future, though, uh, with regards to these smaller units that are more financeable, but I would say that the manufacturing and the construction aspects of that is going to be really important. Because where we got in trouble with a lot of the rea other reactors is one, upfront capital costs are so high, and two, the construction costs are so long that the interest during construction just kills these projects. So to me, the manufacturing and what the US does to try to develop that, and I know New Skill's been talking with, with manufacturers about that aspect. You know, you got to try to um, develop a, a, a low uh, cost reduction program so that you really can um, can uh, demonstrate and, and develop ultimately the manufacturing capability and delivery capability that's going to make these economic in the world of the future. Uh, but it, I think to some extent you can't dismiss it at this point, even though it's not going to be tomorrow. I mean, we're looking at, are we going to be a player and is SMR is going to be uh, really a viable option in the 2030 time period internationally? And, and I think the risk of us not pursuing that market is enormous. Yeah. I'll, I'll, just uh, say quick, I'll just say quickly, uh, first, first of all, each large reactor ordered in the world is more than $5 billion in construction, initial fuel loads, and initial operations contracts, and 
you know, for many of them, more than double that figure. So you don't need a whole lot of reactor orders for U.S. companies to have a potential very, very large play. There are about 450 operating large reactors in the world, most of which are in countries that are supplied by U.S. companies and that are a very large market for U.S. nuclear vendors and supply chains for fuel, for services, for a lot of things, e even without new ones being built. And, and I'll also pick up on the, the climate change point uh, because I think you know, there's a lot of very credible data that shows that growth in nuclear power has to be a component to be able to meet climate change. And without it, we, don't, we won't meet the goals of, 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 the, of the climate targets. Um, and therefore, be it carbon pricing or, or something, uh, there's going to have to be a change in how these markets are addressed, or we won't meet the climate change goals. And maybe that's the future. But I think to succeed, nuclear power has to grow if we're going to succeed at meeting climate goals. Thanks, Seth. Go ahead. Um, just to, to Miles's point, I think even if the, there is a flat or a decline, that doesn't mean the U.S. influence on responsible nuclear behavior should decline as well. Um, these reactors are going to be, the ones we have are going to be continuing to operate. Um, the one, and the... Um, the decommissioning process of these reactors will have nonproliferation implications as well. And the U.S. is going to be the one to – we, we're going to want to be the ones that are setting the pace on what do you do with export-controlled items when they start to come out of facilities. Um, where do those go? How, what are the responsibilities of, of either the exporter or the current owner uh, towards those? Those are the kinds of things. If the U.S. is not part of that conversation – uh, then, then the the lowest common denominator will will obtain, and that that could create more danger. The other thing is, I, I just can't let all the enthusiasm for SMRs on the on the panel go without reminding uh, that we, because these are mostly still, with new scales exception, mostly still on the drawing board. We have a chance to design in safeguards by design, security by design, that makes these not only safer and cheaper, but also more uh, easier for nuclear newcomers to operate uh, and while, while maintaining the highest standards of security and safeguards. Uh, these, these do, that does not happen um, automatically, and we need a, a considered program of support to make sure that the uh, designer community is has access to the resources to allow them to do security and safeguards by design as they uh, as they continue to, to uh, promote these reactor types. Thank you. Um, at least one more question. Hi, um, my name is Prasad Kadambi. I'm a consultant. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, uh, the possibility of uh, the World Bank changing its, uh, its policies and priorities. Uh, I'd like to know more about what it takes for that to happen and who is going to bell the cat. So I, I was the one to mention that, and I, I could just uh, address it briefly. This is, a, this is a, um, an effort that I believe we started we may have started in the Bush administration, but I know that we, we pursued it in the Obama administration, um, which was to first convince the United States that we should make this pitch to the World Bank, that they should actually um, be able to lend to, to the nuclear industry. Um, I think it's a, it's a risk challenge for them right now um, that they don't want to enter into to the risk of, of doing that. Um, they are also concerned with liability. So there's work to be done, um, I think, with the World Bank to do it. But there's smarter people in the room here than, than I that can um, address those challenges. But I think it's, it's a discussion that we need to have going forward it, as the developing world looks to nuclear for, um, you know, particularly smaller reactors for their grid size and for things like desalinization as well as just power generation. Thank you, Joyce. We'll do one more question right here up front. least from the Partnership for Global Security, and I hear that several of you have addressed the human capital drain, and I was wondering what is 
what are some steps we can take to not only make the nuclear industry seem like a more feasible career path for those in college, but also for mid-level professionals as we are bleeding those as well? Bill, please. I'll uh, provide one comment. I'm sure others will want to weigh in here. I mean, you gotta look, there's a cart and a horse issue here. People are not gonna pursue a career unless the industry is, vi is, is vital and, and uh, vibrant. And I think most of the people, and I, don't, I don't know how many people here, I, I show of hands, how many people here have ever oper operated a nuclear reactor? <laughs> Seriously, I'm, I'm asking, there's a reason I'm asking that, okay? And so, so there's some experience in the room. I think if, if you haven't done it, it's a little hard to appreciate. It's not like reading a book. <laughs> it's not. And uh, the hardest job I've ever had in my entire life, and I've had 16 jobs since I graduated from Naval Academy, the hardest job I had was engineer officer on an old attack submarine in the mid-1980s. And the training, the qualification, the maintenance standards to keep that ship operating correctly and properly to high standards, it is hard. It's very rewarding, but this is hard work. And people will not choose this hard work path unless they know there's a bright future ahead. And currently, I, I, I'm on Impose Advisory Council. i pretty plugged in with the, uh, what's going on in the industry. Not an expert, but I have some contacts. And I'll just tell you that people today are not looking to go uh, seek jobs at some commercial util utilities operating nuclear power plants because of their concerns in the future. So to make this bring good college graduates, mid-career professionals, all that, I think, is largely dependent upon people's assessment of the prospects for the industry for the future. Thank you. Anything else? Joyce? I also think we have to look at, uh, so we have the same problem in the U.S. government and particularly in the technical field. Um, we also have to look at the employee of the future. And an employee of the future is not necessarily going to be a 20 or 30 year employee. And that's challenging because you want to have the reactor operating experience going forward. So we have to have a creative ways to keep um, our, particularly the younger staff, engaged. We have to look at things like, can, can we do um, job share? Is there a way for them to um, cross train? Is there a way for them to work in different sectors within, their, um, in, within the industry or you know, swap into other parts of the industry? Work-life balance is important to them. So, so the traditional way we look at employees in general, like not, not even in the tech sector, but in the tech sector in particular, just because the, the years of operating experience is important, I think is challenging. And I see it in the nuclear complex within the Department of Energy where we have some challenges keeping like criticality safety expertise um, and um, rad techs. Those, those jobs are high demand jobs, but um, we, we have trouble keeping individuals, even if they're well compensated in those positions for a long period of time because they, they just get interested in other things and they're not looking for necessarily a 30-year career in that particular narrow field. Thank you. I would like to close on time. Is that all right? All right. So I'm going to... I'm going to wrap things up with a little bit of a recap, and then we can move to the reception and, and continue to discuss any of these topics and ask more questions. Um, I know we've been going for quite a while, but this is an important and rich topic, the discussion of which needs to continue, especially among policymakers. Dr. Bronson asserted that energy relationships will have immense impact on future political relations. It's evident to most Americans that oil and natural gas play important roles in our foreign policy. There, there's regular media coverage of that topic. Unconventional oil and gas and the increased mobility of natural gas with new technologies have led to sweeping changes in global markets. And we heard this earlier. The US has become a net exporter of natural gas. LNG's competitiveness is loosening the grip of some countries that control key pipelines. Um, Professor Megan O'Sullivan of Harvard suggests in her book, Windfall, that natural gas and oil are becoming less effective as political tools and more driven by mar markets. And Dr. Bronson touched on this as well. A transition to a more sustainable energy supply could generate major changes in global politics and relationships. Politics of pipelines could be replaced by politics of supergrids. The place of oil could be taken by lithium or cobalt, for example. Today our speakers talked about related issues in nuclear energy where I can imagine valuable opportunities for the United States. Nuclear energy supplier customer relationships are materially different from those relationships in oil and gas. Nuclear, as illustrated by some of the cases that Dr. Eichord and others highlighted, is characterized by technological dependence that is much more enduring. 
Um, according to Jessica Jewell and her co-authors in a paper in the May 2019 issue of Energy Policy, nuclear plants in Hungary, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and the Czech Republic can only be fueled by a single Russian company. As Russia expands its sales, that dynamic will grow and expand. Similarly, the expertise involved in operating and maintaining key components of a particular design of nuclear power plant is often housed within just a few companies. That is just the energy supply part of the relationship. Other interactions that our speakers cover today involve nuclear safety, security, and nonproliferation, all issues of immense importance to the United States and the world. Ms. Connery touched on the issue of our supply chain for our national security needs as well. Despite the relative loosening of oil and gas markets, most people would still ascribe a degree of associated political power to the major suppliers. So here are some facts and figures again. Um, according to Juul, 18 countries out of nearly 200 account for about 90% of global oil and gas supply, with Saudi Arabia supplying 19% of internationally traded crude oil and Russia supplying 20% of internationally traded gas as of 2016. By comparison, for nuclear technologies, six countries account for 90% of supply. And Russia is the supplier in 43% of nuclear technology agreements. This is not a commodity market characterized by a straightforward bidding process that is driven by energy prices. There are a handful of suppliers, and in most cases, their governments are parties to their deals. As Dr. Icor, Dr. Bronson, Ms. Connery, and our other speakers today described, Russia and China are both thinking and acting strategically. They both have the capacity and the will to bundle generous financing with their nuclear deals. The United States doesn't operate in the same way, though we have some support mechanisms, like Exim Bank, as Ms. Connery described. Where we excel most is in innovation. We have the best innovators, labs, and private investors in the space, and moving that innovation to commercialization provides us with a real opportunity to compete if we can complement it with supportive government policy and a coordinated industry approach. Another area where we have a leg up is in regulation and safety, and Captain Ostendorf and Dr. Icord both recommended increasing our international activities in that area. I hope that you enjoyed the discussion today and that you'll join us in room 215 down the hall for some refreshments. I thank you for your atten attention and your endurance, and I want to close by giving our speakers a big round of thanks for their time and their insights today. Thank you.